baseline to better uh, reduce my risk loss. And so I would worry that if we're not careful, we'll measure how well we're doing in terms of conservation effort as trying not to make this be as bad as it already looks. Rather than going back to the targets that we've already set, which is to reduce the rate of biodiversity or to prevent those species that are threatened from growing extinct. And I think that we need to be cautious about adjusting our baselines such that we still achieve the targets we've set. And now, for example, if you take the overall RBI, this is just a graph that I put together, it doesn't matter where you put the baseline, the declines continue. However, if we're going to make predictions about um, these, the state of biodiversity over time, I think they need to be, so these are really great, these are great, these are looking at what the trends might look like in, in a few years, but they don't tell us much about how to mitigate the them. They don't tell us about what the drivers are, they just say, if we continue as normal, it won't look good. And I think that we need to move beyond these. And there are various projects, some people in this room have begun to look at, the effect of habitat change on these population drivers or to create models like the Manning model which begins to get at a mechanistic understanding of how species are responding to the various things that uh, they rely on and I think what, that's where we need to go to spend our dollar rather than trying to understand uh, the history of these trends. And that same thing can be done for uh, conservation response. Um, so, my thesis is essentially that, so without making these predictions about the likely outcome of different scenarios, it's unlikely that we're going to get anywhere near these 2020 targets. Uh, but those predictions need to be, and I'm trying to bring in some of the stuff, so I had a few slides after this about what these predictions need to be, but I've actually stolen uh, Charlie, so we were doing a workshop on it. And she basically drew this diagram of a prediction, which sums up what everyone talks about when they talk about making predictions, which is, that we need some model that can take the vast volumes of data we have on abundance trends, on occupancy, uh, on the behavior of species in the wild, and can bring them together with different scenarios about economic change, population change, conservation action, to make actionable predictions that can feed into policy. And this is where we need to spend our money if we're going to make any difference, I would argue. And I said I was going to be brief, but we've got a couple of slides left. It's true that we're moving into a realm where we have a huge amount of data, not just about abundance, occupancy, threat status, but about the daily lives of animals in the wild. So people are beginning to collect data like this, which is the migration of Manx shearwaters overlaid on remotely sensed chlorophyll for the globe. And this is, this is just a little project from a couple of people, but it shows you what these animals are doing day in, day out for over a year, and that can then be used to make predictive models for how their behavior would respond under different environmental conditions, and this can be driven into the future. And it doesn't really matter too much about what this is, but the point is that we now have these data, and if we don't make some predictions about what we do, and try to take action against those predictions, we're never going to get to the targets that we've set, and they'll be failed.
and if it increased afterwards, why not? If the labeling corresponds to a particular uh, baseline, fine. Maybe some the issue. The issue today is to stop the decline if something is rather left. My question is, uh, looking at the aggregated indexes that you have, but I'm sure for fragmented indexes there is exception for the situation is better. You indicate that conservation is not enough, apparently, to regain what is to flatten uh, the decrease. What could be done in addition to the uh, conservation or particular measures for more conservation to inverse uh, the derivative? Uh, because this, I think, it was not maybe sufficiently explicit in your talk, but you indicated very clearly that there is um, conservation doesn't make it all. Indeed, uh, it seems clear that we're, we're, despite the fact that we're stepping up on conservation, we have more and more protected areas, we have more and more efforts, uh, we're not being able to at least flatten up. It is not my, my suggestion that that should be enough, but we're not even getting there. Um, we need a massive upscaling of investment in conservation. We need, uh, we, we, what we're doing, even though conservation is a major activity, it, uh, there's more than 30% of the planet which is occupied by protected areas, it's a major one which type. It's still, the investment made in conservation fails <coughs> in significance compared to what the amount of money that goes to the, the threat processes of uh, the The budget of the biggest uh, agency, uh, conservation agency in the world, the US Fish and Wildlife Services, is annually the, the size of a small town. So it's not, we need to upscale, if we're going to take this, this uh, seriously, we need to be doing much more. And much more means that we have to understand that there's costs to this conservation. In, the costs include compensating people for the opportunity costs that they lose when they do conservation, compensating farmers if they can't, if they can't farm, also compensating people if they can't use uh, wildlife in the way that they would need to use for their own living. But it's the only way is to take it seriously as a, as a target and to invest. But much more is factor of 2, of 10, or 50? I'll go for 50. <laughs> <laughs> I, so just to, to, to put aside the sort of fail of debate and, and agree, uh, something that's important about identifying what the magnitude of a conservation success is, is to identify those places where we have had that success and what they have been. So that when we spend that money when we upscale that effort, they're focused on the kind of things that happen. And what are the, the wonderful success stories? Uh, is, is it <laughs> conservation areas or it is um, real actions? So, I mean, so protected areas are increasing. We see even within the LPI that the rate of loss within protected areas is less than it is outside of them. But again, I think... Not the real success story. No, but, but that's, that's essentially what we have. <laughs> Accessory is the rate of decline is as bad as we thought, which is worrying. Mm -hmm. Question. Just say that we, when we put our minds to it, we can we can bring species back from extinction. We can reverse its trend. We have examples of things that didn't seem like they had a chance in health, and they're they're coming back. And and the point is, for some of these things, we're questioning because do we have space for them? Can we accommodate them? Can we can lead it? So, um, just building on Serge's point, really, we're, we're, we're heading into a sort of geopolitical space where pressures exist on national health services and politicians talk about in this country, £30 billion pounds being missing out of the NHS budget in 2020. How are we going to present the economic argument to Treasury and government that the financial returns to governments for enhanced expenditure on bioconservation actually are so large that they must prioritise that over other sorts of societal demands. <laughs> because I think that's the question about whether you're going to spend a dollar here or a dollar there. What you're talking about is actually whether you have any dollars to spend at all. I, I, I would argue that the the size of the spend on the conservation area is so tiny that even quadrupling that, 50 times in that, would still be insignificant in terms of the spend on our nuclear armaments. Quantifying how much return that's going to bring, which I think might have been your question, I think is a much trickier. I think 
there are various strategies to try and look for what are the services that these environmental these ecosystems provide. But turning them into, I mean, it, it may be that we have to swallow our scientific uh, thinking and just put a, a dollar value on it and worry a little bit less about it in order to make that um, make those actions occur. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's not happening yet. That, that people just to turn it into. Um, well, I mean, there, are, there are these things that you're know, not just thinking about GDP, but thinking about you know, happiness index or yeah. things like that, mm -hmm. and the relationship between the diversity of the biosphere and the well-being of society is something which might be a, a yeah, valuable. Yeah, I think that would be a very valuable thing to, to get our teeth further. I think that I... So there's a, no doubt an economic value that gets from by the diversity, but it's something that is not very easily measurable in terms of like ideas and inspiration things that we learn from nature, the way the solution that we solve and that we copy, um, patents that we get from chemicals and things, that, things which are not necessarily measurable, but they could be measurable. Um, there are things which are not measurable and probably will never be in terms of well-being, pleasure. And then there is the part which is, I think, not within the economic realm. I mean, somebody made the point that if you try to put a, a, a dollar price on uh, human rights, for example, in the sense of uh, uh, abolition of slavery. You could put a price. You could say that if people are not slaves, they will work better, therefore they're more productive. But probably actually the economic case will be for slavery. And yet you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it because it's something that you would just say, well, it's just not ethical. There's a realm of biodiversity conservation which has to stay within the realm of ethics. You can't just wait, you can't just expect biodiversity to pay for itself in that sense, to, to play in the same level. It has to become something which is a constraint, in the same way that we have human rights is a constraint to development, in the sense that we don't just do development on top of people. We do, unfortunately, but we shouldn't. As in, we, we shouldn't. It's unethical to, to override people's livelihoods for the sake of profit. It, it, it's also unethical to, to, to lose biodiversity, no matter how much money you can get from it. And the, the conversation should stay firmly in that realm, even if there are economic problems. Uh, Actually, you just said it, Anna. I think um, I was only going to say that, that, that there's been a, a lot of talk about ecosystem services and trying to evaluate ecosystem services and, as an argument for conservation. And I kind of feel like I've changed my mind about it. I think we're going to lose that argument because it doesn't stand up. Well, there are some, some, some good examples like bees and pollinizators. We had a very impact. Uh, on agriculture, or in in the rainforest, there are some some examples of pharmaceuticals. So, well, you you could you could push some very good example, but not not a, a the, the danger is that if we if we frame our arguments in terms of that economic value, that we lose to some other argument that it's more important for us to have a health service. That it's more. Whereas if we frame it within the ethical framework, it's wrong for us not to. I think that's almost a stronger argument. It's just a debate not to agree, so say something. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I disagree that we can't necessarily measure happiness. Or, so I think that, uh, for example, within the urban environment, you could probably, through surveys, determine that people are happier, they're more efficient, they're more effective if they're in touch with nature, if they're surrounded by the natural world. And that, that efficiency, could be translated into productivity, could be translated into GDP, that would tell us about how we should build our cities and how we should maintain yes. um, <laughs> I was just bringing it more back to the initial uh, debate. Um, <laughs> I think obviously it's probably a combination of both religions rather than one or the other. But I was interested in that all the indicators we were talking about were species based. And I think now we're talking about restoring biodiversity, it's not just about individual species um, you know, increasing in numbers, it's actually that a lot of as far as growing ecosystems. And I think that's actually where a uh, better baseline becomes really important because the impact of humans has, has been so great that actually in some, in some systems we've got a very artificial uh, combination of species really and we're having have to maintain ecosystem processes in the absence of species being there. Um, and so if, if conservation is in some sense, for example, like in Wildly and going towards restoring whole ecosystems, um, then I think that is maybe where a, a longer baseline is absolutely vital, but it's, it's, it's also very difficult to understand what past ecosystems look like, so it's interested in your I'm afraid everybody will agree. <coughs>
Um, I, yeah, but I agree how to determine that, how to measure it, is a, is a tricky piece. I mean, one could imagine trying to take data for species ensembles for networks that we've got to the past and trying to look at whether those, the diversity of species and their relationships are changing over time, or whether that index of, I don't know, niche space or something is shifting. I don't, I don't know, but I think you're right. I think that when we get to that point where we're trying to restore what we just Can you guys speak up a bit? Sorry. So I'm not sure that people at the back can hear. Can you hear? Without microphones, stuff, No, they can't. They're shaking. Well, one of them is shaking. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> had been 90, 95% declines, I mean, I, I, how, I, I don't know at what point, I, it'd be interesting to know at what point we suddenly say no, because we haven't but can yet. I the other way around, not just <laughs> like the bad news, oh my god, you climbed 50%, blah, 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 it's also, the, these, these historical things also tell us the realm of possibilities, and in some cases they're just amazing, as in the, the sheer abundance that we, when we start digging into the historical sources, I think that's one of the things that is absolutely exciting. Is you start reading and it's a different world you're reading about. I mean, I'm going to say a little anecdote. Uh, agriculture. There is the, we have this river, you know, the estuary. Estuaries, you know, the estuaries. There's like no trees, you know, there's just estuaries, you know, like floods and stuff. I, I read the other day, so I was looking for some stuff. So I was reading about navigators that were going down uh, into, the, into the Congo basin. So the Portuguese navigators, as they were going down to the Congo basin. And they get to the estuary of the Congo. And they look at the issue of the Congo and they say, doesn't it look just like Lisbon? Like the entrance of the Taj, the, the Tagus estuary. And I was like, what? I mean, we don't have any trees. It's the estuaries don't have trees. They're not supposed to have trees. They're just this flat, open thing with ducks and stuff. And it completely changed my mind. It's like, maybe we had a forest. And maybe they were. Maybe it was forested as an estuary. And it just opens our mind to the possibilities of what could it actually be? Imagine rivers full of salmon, imagine turtles nesting on the beaches, imagine seals, imagine the whales, imagine these things just coming to our, to our shores. It, it's also a, mes a message of hope, not just a message of, it's all going downhill. It's just like, we could have all this stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, being a debate, I guess I should uh, fire you up against each other, but actually, uh, <laughs> I can have a uh, finding a commonality because you both talked about counterfactual. So Anna was talking about agricultural looking behind, right? What, what would be the difference between what happened and what would happen otherwise if we didn't do the conservation? And you, Robin, was saying uh, we need actionable uh, science. So we need to look at what would be the difference between different conservation interventions in the future, right? So there is a common ground there. But what I realized is actually the baseline are important also for forward projection, projection because uh, if you push back to, for example, the baseline for FBI, even if you look forward, you may probably find a very different thing just because of the nature of the law. And uh, so, maybe this actually fires you up because you're yeah. not talking about the baseline. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am going to agree. <laughs> and I, I think that it's, a, it's an important point that without, and I, this is where I, I get put aside the bill of debate, I guess, but Without these data and good historical data, it's very hard for us to make any claims about the accuracy of the predictions that we make. And I think that whether it's counterfactuals into the, in the present scenarios, they're the same models we 
we would make for the future. I mean, uh, the conceit is that we can't, we, we have to do both, I would say. Causing the debate. Yes, even though it shows that conservation isn't having much of an effect. Critical, does it appear to say that conservation is having an increased effect over time? That yellowy, was it yellow, was it green, the bit at the bottom? Yeah. It was getting bigger over time, so even though the effect isn't that much, it is actually increasing. So that's good. The, <laughs> 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 yeah, despite increasing pressure, despite all that, there is a little bit of a... That is correct. The cumulative effect is definitely increasing as we kind of know more what to do. I also am neglected to say that that's a, a major underestimate the impact of conservation because the existing species subset the conservation action allowed them to change that way, like going up and they were endangered and now they lots of people everywhere. So there's all these other things that, for example, didn't go as much as they could or stayed in the same category but would have gone further down if it had been for conservation. There's that is an underestimated slice of impact. Um, so I think there's two good news that, that it looks small but it's actually bigger. It's just that we don't have a very good way of measuring. It's counterfactual, it's difficult to imagine. And the other one, you're absolutely right, I haven't seen that positive side. It's actually in critic. <laughs> that have already developed and the countries that will be developing, the countries like United Kingdom and Germany, they've already gone through their industrial revolution, expanded, done their bit to climate change and destruction of species, as opposed to countries in the developing world that actually need to go through that phase for their, to, to, to sustain the demand and to expand economically. Partly I would agree, but I would, I would wonder what, oh, I'm, I'm can you hear me? You know, I mean, no. Working. You have to kind of like shout. Okay, I can try to. I'll start projecting better. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, it's so, so the question was: is, is it unfair to place the same targets for biodiversity loss or otherwise across nations that haven't necessarily gone through the industrial revolution, the population expansion that the Western countries have gone through? And partly I would say, yes, like partly, but I don't know if that means we shouldn't do it. Um, I, it is unfair, it would mean, depends what you mean by unfair. So it's true that for countries where they're only just to expand the option to do that, but it has to be done in a way that they don't go through the same biodiversity class that we've got through. The, the, the damage is already done in the developed countries, and the biodiversity is more or less in, in, in the developing countries. For example, in, uh, um, with respect to the trees, we had about 30 or uh, uh, 100 trees in, in, in France, the uh, species of trees. It, it, it's, it's, it's not in comparison with what you have in, in the rainforest. So the biodiversity has to be uh, protected where it's still there. Yeah. And I guess the question would be whether we can use our ingenuity to allow those countries to go where they want to go without losing that biodiversity. And I think so. Some, one of the graphs, if I can remember, in the Living Planet Report from the Global Footprint Network, those guys, was indicating that countries like uh, Brazil had managed to increase their, uh, their human well-being, their index of how uh, well off people are in their country in terms of well-being, without significantly increasing their impact. It remains to be seen whether that's because they've externalized their impact elsewhere. Can I just add something to that? I think one is the point that, one point that you're saying that it could be saying it's a burden to these countries, but it can also be an opportunity. Can they jump the step of having to trash everything before they can get to this level of development? And it reminds me, you know, like a lot of African countries, they bypassed the, the fixed telephones and everybody just went straight to mobile phones. 
is like, do they should we force them to go through the fixed mobile, the fixed telephone phase? We don't. They can just bypass and go to a better solution if we have a better solution. Um, <laughs> Um, sort of direct and indirect approaches to uh, securing biodiversity globally. So if you think of biology of crime in a city, you could spend more on the police force and just try and hammer out the crime, or you could try and look at the root causes of the crime and think about poverty and education. Here if we look at the threats to biodiversity worldwide, overexploitation, habitat degradation, habitat loss, a lot of that, for example, is driven by the amount of food. So with, with our dollar of conservation wealth, broadly defined money, say Robin, you know, would, would you spend that on direct conservation or would you spend it on crop research to try and increase agricultural yields to reduce pressure? You know, and, and I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have an opinion either way, but I'm interested in your thinking on it. I don't know. I, I, it would be nice to have a scientific response to that question, I think. I mean, if, if there was a way for us to determine where that dollar would be most effectively spent, whether it's on, so it might be that we could, so, some of the global footprint statistics have looked at the increases in efficiency of uh, food production over time, and they're not keeping up with the demand. And so it might be that the use of some of those statistics would allow us to decide where to spend that dollar, but I, I don't know. So, it's just that I, I, I agree with you that I'm not sure if there's a scientific answer to that, but there's an economic answer to that, and it's called the Jepson's Paradox. So People have found that an increase in efficiency on its own right does not reduce consumption, it stimulates consumption because the prices go down. That's what we've seen. The prices of food go down, we just consume more, we trash more, and that's it. So I think if I had that dollar, I would put half in restraining, as in, I think you need to do things side by side. You need to protect some areas and say you can't put agriculture on this land and then uh, you have to increase productivity on the remaining land. But if you're just increasing the productivity alone, you will not reduce uh, habitat loss. Is there a question here? No? Okay, so it's... Yes? Okay. So I think we all agree that we... Louder. We can repeat it. The money, where is the money going to come from? <laughs> okay, I'm rich. I'm not going uh, No, I think, I think it has to be part of, I mean, we have, we've seen these targets, these commitments. Nobody takes them seriously. I mean, we miss the target. Oh, shame. Unfortunately, people don't take seriously. There's all these other targets for poverty, for uh, um, child mortality, which people unfortunately also don't take seriously. These things have to become binding commitments. They have to become legal commitments that people then work with, within, they become constraints within which people work. And so far, unfortunately, as with several other ethical issues, not just the conservation of the biodiversity, they are, and I think once we have them as constraints, people will work around them, even if it's at the expense of reducing our per capita consumption, for example, which is quite big. Yeah, I mean, I, the only, I guess, comment is that is that I think we all agree, but not everyone agrees, sadly. And I think I, I don't know how we get to a point where we convince people who think that this is us making these numbers up. Yeah, so um, so I think you're both right. Um, so in a, in a rapidly changing world, which is what we did, using baselines is a kind of weird thing to do anyway, because it, it's kind of making an assertion that there's something correct about some point in the past, or there's something correct about some linear trend from some point in the past going forward. And I think just given the rate of land use change, climate change, population growth, economic growth and so on, 
you know, we live in a very dynamic world. So actually, I would say the problem here is about setting the targets, it's the targets, and the, it would be the deviation from the target that is the important thing. And the target should be what do we want or need, rather than what did we used to have. So I want to ask a question that's based on that for you both to answer, based on the um, the data that you showed, which are these two very